Hey everyone, I just want to welcome you again to Mathematics for the Impatient. Uh, we have with us again today Stan Cladco, and today we are going to discuss the mathematics of token transfers, a super important thing because all of us involved in, in crypto and even new people want to understand it a little bit better. So I think first off, let's talk, you know, Stan, let's talk a little bit about what actually happens when a token is transferred from its native blockchain, say Bitcoin, to another blockchain, say Ethereum. Um, how can how can Ethereum live on a Bitcoin and vice versa? So talk to us a little bit about that transfer. Yes, they actually at this subject is really interesting. It's also kind of strange and counterintuitive because many people, when they actually do token transfers, they don't understand what token transfers actually mean. And so what I'm gonna discuss is a little bit strange and will surprise you. So typically, you know, let's say you want to transfer a token, you want to transfer, say, Bitcoin to Ethereum, you go to a website or mobile app, you click, and then what you see that, you know, graphically your tokens, whatever your Bitcoin is transferred to another network like Ethereum or Scale. Now, it turns out that behind the scenes, nothing like this happens. Actually, nothing is transferred. In fact, how can you transfer something? How to transfer Bitcoin to Ethereum? Satoshi Nakamoto, when he or she uh, designed Bitcoin, they, they never knew about Ethereum. So how could you actually transfer tokens from one uh, blockchain to another? And the fact is the transfer never happens. What actually happens is a very different thing. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about this thing. Let's say you want to transfer US dollars from America, from the States to Europe, and you want to do it instantly, but how can you do it? So what you could do, you could have a machine that you stick your US dollar or hundred dollars bill into the machine on the US side, and this hundred dollar bill is frozen, is inside the machine. And then uh, there could be another machine in Europe that prints receipts, and this other machine once you stuck the US $100 in the US, this other machine would print in Europe a receipt saying someone actually stuck this $100 bill in the US. Uh, so this here's the receipt. So the receipt then becomes money in Europe. You go and give people these receipts, they give you other receipts. And then anytime you want to go and get the actual US dollar, you would actually stick the receipt back into the machine in Europe and the receipt would get burned and at the same time a hundred dollar bill would be unfrozen in the states. This is exactly what happens on blockchains. So when you say think your tokens are transferred, surprise, surprise, they never transfer. What happens is that your tokens are frozen on the native blockchain such as Bitcoin and the receipt is printed on the destination chain and the receipt is used in lieu as a replacement for the actual native tokens. Very cool, awesome. So maybe I think a kind of a next topic that would be really good to talk about is the notion of a token bridge. So can you tell us a little bit more like what is a token bridge? Why is it important? And, and, and why is it important for that token bridge to be decentralized? Oh, that's a great question, Marcus. So now, once we have this uh, understanding, now, now we understand the tokens are never transferred. So we have this analogy of this machine in Europe and, and, and in the States. And then if you think about these two machines, there's a secure link between the two of them. And if the link is secure, guess what? You stick $100 bill and $100 in Europe. But if the link is insecure, if someone can actually hack the link, you could stick $1 bill in the States and a $100 receipt would be printed in Europe, meaning that you would actually essentially print $99 or could do anything. So the security of the link between the two machines is extremely, extremely important because if you break the link, you can steal the money. Or as an example, let's say the machine in the States has $1,000 frozen in it. You could just have a fake receipt and send a fake message from Europe to the States. And then this $1,000 would be unfrozen, even though you would actually have nothing in Europe. You would have no receipts. 
you will just hack the system. So the security of this link between Europe and the States in this example is super important. And the link actually is the bridge. So when we say that there is a token bridge between a blockchain X and blockchain Y, which this means that this, there is a secure link that actually when you freeze a token on blockchain X, it sends a message to blockchain Y and something on blockchain Y actually prints this receipt on blockchain Y that is used as replacement for, for the actual native tokens. So this link, the secure link is the bridge. And there are pretty much two ways to do the bridge. You could actually have someone, something totally centralized, you know, like we as a scale, as a company, or myself as a constant in Pletco, I could just be a secure link and the security will just depend on me being honest and believe it or not, but many blockchain, blockchains use this. So when you actually transfer your tokens to another blockchain, there's nothing except this trusted party that you trust that actually this party is secure and trusted and the party secures the link. Or in, as in case of scale, the actual link is decentralized. So there's no trusted party. Instead, what happens in, in case of scale, when the a message goes from blockchain X to blockchain Y, such as from Ethereum to scale, a large number of nodes from scale network sign this message. So the security of the message does not depend on the trusted party, does not depend on human. It actually depends on the large number of nodes collectively voting and signing a message and saying this particular message is secure, meaning that someone deposited you know, 100 Bitcoins or someone deposited 100 Ether. Now, please print those receipts on the scale network. And for scale, this entire process is totally open. Our entire source code is open. Our network is totally decentralized. We don't control any of our bridges. The entire thing, the entire bridging thing in scale is totally independent and decentralized. And scale at the moment, to our knowledge, is the first ever network that has a fully open source and fully decentralized bridge, something that we call the IMA, Interchain Messaging Agent. And we have nothing to hide. You know, we don't control any of it. It's all controlled by the centralized nature of the network. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a actually a really important a really important thing to think about because I think decentralization is one of the key topics that a lot of people um, are concerned about. I, let, let's jump a little bit, and I want to talk now about token transfer fees. <laughs> it's the thing that everyone is curious about. Why is it expensive to to transfer a token? And sometimes the price is less, and sometimes it's more. You know what determines. What, what determines the time it takes to do that transfer too. So I think we have two questions, both why does it cost a certain amount? And then why does it take X amount of time for it to actually occur? Great question, Marcus. So again, let's come back to this analogy of the machines, the machine in Europe and the machine in the States. What is this machine? The machine is actually software and the software is called a smart contract. So when we transfer from the Ethereum network to scale, there's a machine on the Ethereum network, a smart contract on the Ethereum network, and a smart contract on the scale network. If we transfer between two scale chains, there are two smart contracts on scale chains, on the destination chain and on the source chain. So when, they, when someone sticks these tokens into the machine and the machine works, there are fees. We all know that on blockchain, for any smart contract to run, there are fees. So when we transfer from Ethereum, to scale, the machine on the Ethereum side incurs some Ethereum fees, and the machine on the scale side incurs some scale fees. On scale, things are really, really cheap. So when you transfer uh, tokens between one scale chain and another scale chain, it's super cheap, almost zero. But then when we transfer from Ethereum to scale and from scale to Ethereum, because we need to involve uh, smart contracts running on the Ethereum side, there are some Ethereum fees. So one of the way to lower those fees is that once you are actually part of scale network, once you transfer the tokens to scale network, you don't go to Ethereum, you just stay on scale where things are really cheap. So this, these are the fees. And then the time, the transfer time. 
The machine on the Ethereum side needs to work to complete, to finalize whatever it's doing when you stick tokens into it. And then the machine on the scale side needs to work. Scale machine works fast. Our finality time is about four seconds. So when we transfer money between one scale chain and another scale chain is like four seconds transfer time. But when we transfer from Ethereum to scale and, and back, since the machine, the smart contract on the Ethereum side needs to work, we need to actually wait until it's, it works. And the Ethereum finalization time is maybe minutes. That's why interchain token transfers between Ethereum and scale takes take minutes. Having said that, uh, to our knowledge, we are the fastest because other solutions have hours of transfer times. Some of them have four hours. Some have uh, you know up to seven days transfer times. To our knowledge, scale has currently the fastest running decentralized bridge in terms of token transfers between scale and Ethereum mainnet. And for token transfers inside scale from one scale chain to another, the token transfers are really, really fast. Cool. OK. So you know, we talked about tokens, how they get transferred, speed, cost. I think the final thing to talk about is a very novel DeFi concept, which is token swaps. So you know, there are several projects, really, that are promising cheaper ways to transfer tokens by doing these token swaps. Um, how are token swaps implemented? And, and I think kind of secondarily, you know, without giving any financial advice, because of course we don't give any financial advice, how can investors make money? What, what is the, the mechanism for making money by providing liquidity to token swaps? Token swaps are really interesting things. They are like a derivative, a very surprising idea, which is kind of a derivative of the bridge. You can't have token swaps if you don't have a bridge. But it turns out once you have a bridge, you can have a, a cheaper solution that I'm going to describe now. Let's say you have a bridge. Let's say you, you can transfer US dollars from the US to Europe. And let's say the transfer fee, the machines, whatever we discussed, the transfer fee, let's say, is $100. right? So it takes $100 to run all of this machinery, and then you transfer US dollars to Europe. How could you actually? then help people that want to transfer $1. If you want to transfer $1, you know, what's the point paying $100 fee? Turns out there's a very interesting solution, very easy to understand. Let's say you, Marcos, already running the machine, and let's say you already have $1,000 in Europe and $1,000 in the States. So you are the capital provider. You have the capital, and your capital is both in in the States where you have $1,000, but, but also in Europe, you also have $1,000 because you transferred, you use this machinery to transfer some of your money. So you have money in Europe, you have money in the States. Now I come to you, Marcos, and I say, Marcos, can you please transfer for me $1 from the States to Europe? So what you do, and you tell me, okay, I'll do it for one cent. So you charge me one cent, and what you do, I pay to you $1 in the States. I, I send, give it to you in the States. And then because you also have your money in Europe, you give it uh, this $1 to me in Europe or transfer to my European bank account. So because you already have money in, in both places, actually there's no transfer takes place. You just take my money in the States and you actually give me money in Europe without any transfer happening. Now, after this, what's gonna happen is that you're now gonna have $1,001 in the States and $999 in Europe because you're giving me $1 in Europe, right? So you, you have some imbalance. So if you, after, but some people may actually transfer money back. And if you have a gross imbalance, let's say after like a year of operating, you have like $1,500 in, in the States and $500 in Europe. Guess what you can do? You can transfer it a large chunk using the bridge to Europe. So you're providing this capital, you're keeping money on all different places. And if you need to rebalance your money, you transfer big chunks. And when you transfer big chunks, you don't care about the, uh, the transfer fees because your chunk is big. And then for small people like me, you can actually provide this virtual transfers where nothing actually gets transferred. You just give, yeah, I give you one thing in one place, 
and you give me another thing in another place. It's a super simple idea. It actually can work with any chain. Uh, the way we see that the way it's described, that doesn't really depend on the chain. What it depends on is that some people can be capital providers. So you, Marcos, can literally have like $1,000 and put your $1,000 over different chains. And then you provide the capital. And then you actually participate in, in the small transfers. And for every transfer, you charge one, one cent. So you see that there is token swaps actually allow much cheaper transfers while you still have to have uh, the base transfer, the, uh, the bridge, because the capital providers will use the bridge to transfer large chunks. So the way we see this entire industry moving is that there will be capital providers that will spread their money in big chunks over different chains, and they will use bridges, like the centralized bridge we have at scale, and these capital providers will actually provide really cheap swaps, token swaps for small people that will actually do small, small and fast transfers. That's how this thing, entire thing is moving. And we at scale are currently working with several projects and startups that are actually meant to provide these token transfers uh, in, in using swaps. And I think when the industry next year will be having all of these projects, will have much cheaper token transfers, not only within scale ecosystem, but from scale to other blockchains in Ethereum network, or maybe to Bitcoin or some other chains. So overall, the entire direction is very promising. And I think probably like 12 months from now, this entire landscape will change and token transfers using swaps will be really cheap and you will be able to really fast transfer tokens from one blockchain to another. Awesome, very cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you learned a lot about tokens, how they, how they price, what they cost, swapping all the kind of cool different things. You can go to scale.network to learn about scale. And we definitely also encourage you to check out our Twitter accounts and our Telegram all down in the, uh, in the information below. All right, thanks very much. Take care, bye Stan.